Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Couldn't be better, right? Good. Um, welcome to the lecture of material science. Um, today, let's continue to our lecture to the uh, section 2.6, primary interatomic bonds. Um, as we mentioned last week, the primary interatomic bond involve um, ionic bonding, covalent, covalent bonding, and the metallic bonding. And how about the secondary bonds? Secondary bonds involve van der Waals force, right? Okay, because that's uh, related with the dipole. We might be able to talk about this topic today, um, but, oh, no, no, no. We are going to talk about ionic bonds today. Uh, so last week, we start to introdu introduce the ionic bonds uh, using an example of a sodium chloride. Hope you remember. OK, and then uh, we talk about uh, the process of the cre ionic crystal formation involve electron transfer and then attraction by a mobile opposite charge. And then once they from autumn to become ions, from ions to become molecular and from molecular become molecules and then gradually and they get together and it become crystal. A lot of, lot of uh, atoms get together. And this is called ionic bond. And this is an example of a sodium chloride crystal. I hope you remember. So um, we summarize the formation of ionic bonds, in, uh, including three steps, right? Neutral, neutral to become cation and anion. This is a, this is a charge transfer process. And second one is from cation anion to become molecular. And step three is from molecular to become molecules, and from molecules to become crystal. Okay? So the modeling of this of the ionic bonds is like this. Because why they uh, from cation from the from the atoms to become cation anion because they want to reach to S2, P6, Rtex stability, right? And after that, because of columbic attraction, they attract to each other, okay? And of course, they have attraction force as well as repulsion force. So last week, we had, uh, have we talked about this? Yes, we do, right? Okay, and this is important is, part is that, um, When we think about energy between two atoms, when they go together and when they are getting closer and closer, there's a limit because attraction and repulsion force has to become, has to become, has to be equal. So for example, we have a two, we have a cation, we have sodium cation, we have chloride anion, and then when they are very far away, uh, when they are very far away, they start to get closer. And this is the description of the attraction energy. Attraction energy is Q1 times Q2. This has charge Q1 and charge Q2 and uh, divided by four pi epsilon zero R. R is the distance between these two ions, right? So if you rearrange this equation, you can get this in the end. As you can see, if I have one charge and one charge from the, uh, of the cation and anion, and you can get this, which is minus psi in the front of this equation, uh, it, it makes sense to you, right? Because it is past negative, negative and positive. So as you know, the energy, the attraction energy is the function of what? It's a function of the radius, the distance between these two atoms. Okay, I, I don't need you to remember this equation, don't worry about this, but I want you to know the energy is the function of the red, uh, distance between these two ions. Now how about repulsion? So you can get curved from here, 
right? This is the curve you get because this is a negative sign, and you can get curve here. However, you have repulsion force once they get closer and closer, and they started to repel to each other. So repulsive fo force or energy only occur when these two ions are very close. There's no repulsion force or energy here in this in this position or in this position. No, start to become when they get very close. So the energy of the repulsion is equal to B divided by R power N. N is uh, we call bone bone uh, exponent, which is between six to twelve. This is the integer number. It can be seven, eight. It depends on different uh, pairs of the ions. Okay, so B is a constant. So as you know, the energy of the repulsion energy is also a function of distance between two ions. Okay. So when you want to get these two together, that would be the, the net energy or net force, right? So once they get closer enough, that they will stay in the same, they will stay in a constant distance. That's called equilibrium spacing. Now, the equilibrium spacing is here, from here to here, equilibrium spacing. And the energy is called bounding energy. I hope you remember bounding energy and equilibrium spacing. Right? R zero and uh, E zero. Right. So this is if not uh, this two very far, and uh, they have a the radius is six hundred pico m a uh, pico meter. And this is the radius. Uh, the distance between two ions is two hundred thirty six, reach to equilibrium. Right. And this is about one hundred eighty. Right, so uh, next is equilibrium spacing. We know that and energy, bounding energy. Okay, let's re refresh. Let's recall what we learned about equilibrium spacing. So once you reach here, energy becomes the lowest energy, and then both the the atoms ions will stop here in this distance. So this for the net. Energy is equal to the attraction energy plus the repulsion energy. And what we know, according to the previous slide, we know that this is attraction energy, this is repulsion energy. So as as you know, this is the this is uh, columbic uh, energy. Uh, sorry, the charge, right? This is the charge of the electron, and then this is constant. So you can rearrange these numbers to become a constant. So as the new, you know. The, the net energy will be equal to the minus a divided by r plus b divided by r power n. This is the equation. You know that uh, the, for the net energy. How about for the equilibrium spacing? It, according to this energy, we know equilibrium spacing is when the energy re reach the lowest position, right? Which is the lowest energy. So as you know, if we we do the different. We we do the. Uh, we use the differential equation from this, and we can get the lowest number, right? So as we know, if R is if force equal to zero, right? By differential equation, you can understand. You you do the uh, differential equation, and then you got this net here that will be equal to zero, and so. As you know, this is the lowest energy, and uh, this, you can get the distance. Uh, that's what we call. Uh, that's why we call the. This is the equilibrium spacing. Okay. How about the energy of the ionic bonds? This is energy of ionic bond, right? And then. <coughs> Once we want to know the energy reach to this part, what's how do we do that? Of course, if we put the R into this equation, we will get the answer, right? If we put R zero, this is R zero equilibrium spacing. We put this into into this one, and we will get that. And then <coughs> this is the answer. You can get E E 
is a function of r. If we put r zero into this equation, that's the uh, equation. That's the uh, answer we can get from here. Again, I don't want you to remember this equation because um, we are not going to uh, ask you to find out the ends, uh, do a simple calculation. I just want you to know roughly uh, this is the net energy. And then when both, when they reach to equilibrium spacing R0, and this is the, uh, the explanation of the energy when, while the R is equal to when, when r equal to r zero. Okay, so the characteristic of the ionic bond, what's the characteristic? The characteristic of ionic bond is that this bonding is, no, is non-directional. So om, only directional means that is the bonding has no direction. You can go to right, left, up, down, front, back. So this is non-direction, no preferred direction. And it's, un uh, it's unsaturated. So no one-to-one -one bonding. So as you can see, this atom or this ion will bond not only one-to-one. -one. You can bond from here, up, down, left, right, front, back. So it's not one-to-one -one bonding. Can you give me an example of which is one-to-one -one bonding? Covalent bond. We are going to introduce covalent bond. And covalent bond is also is not a, a non-directional, it's a directional. So as you can see, as you can know that sodium chloride, for example, sodium chloride, sorry, uh, hydrochloride, hydrochloride. That's a directional. Anyway, we're going to introduce this later. So there are many, many bonds can form from the any ions. So large arrays of the ions, right? Many, many ions get together. So as, as you know, there are, if we have many, many ions get together, and if it's very close, it becomes solid at room temperature. And as a result, if we have a large a numbers of atoms or ions get together, it becomes a crystal. The crystal, uh, definition of crystal is a regular array, and it repeat, repeat, to become to become a large entities. Right. So next is the energetic of the ionic crystal formation. Let's think of how ion ion bond form and then ionic crystal form. So when I say when I say that uh, iron is ionic bond, they form a crystal. That's what we know, as a, as we know as a common sense, right? But if you think of why the iron ionic bond will eventually become a or will eventually form ionic crystal, and does it make sense to you? So let's. Let's put a model in this in this study. That means that if we have a sodium chloride in the form of molecular, this is called randomly dispersed in the air. Is this stable? We want to find which phase or which uh, status is the most stable status for the uh, sodium chloride. So this is the case one, randomly dispersed. The case two is one line. So you have a one line, and then sodium chloride put one line as a, just like this, and then or it become a three D dimension like this. So which one is more stable, three D or one line or randomly dispersed? It depends on the energy, right? It depends on the the dimension of this energy. If the energy reach the lowest, then we we know that this. Uh, the one will be the most stable um, status for the sodium chloride. You know, um, you might feel curious why, Professor, does anything pack like this, like one line? 
Yes, in a narrow in a narrow scale, if you think of the narrow rods, that's one dimensional material or narrow tube. That's one dimensional materials. Sometimes the crystal pack as they like. That's what we call this. Uh, they have preferred growth direction in a very in a very small scale. Okay, in a huge scale, of course they don't. But in a very small scales, you can form uh, quantum dots, right? Remember, there's only very small uh, dot we call quantum dot. Okay, that's zero dimensional uh, narrow materials, and one dimensional is called narrow tubes, narrow rod, narrow wire, and this is one dimensional narrow materials. Two dimensional is graphene, right, or some kind of um, Two-dimensional materials like oxide materials. Okay, so uh, let's think of these three status or three uh, kind of materials. Which one is more stable? And then we we will know that that will present the this material. Okay. Right. So let's um, think of energy of ionic pairs, sodium chloride, or we call randomly dispersed. So when we think of sodium chloride like this, and we understand for the energy of the ionic bond, a pair, we just tell you that this is the this is the energy, right? For one pair only. So you have you have a cation, uh, you have cation and ion, you have charges for this cation, numbers of the charge, and you got this equation. But however, this is only one pair, only one pair. Okay. So once you put a lot of pairs together, you can add this energy up together, right? And then you can get the energy of the dispersed sodium chloride. Okay? So only one pair. So assume we have energy of the ionic bond for one mole. This is large enough because one mole is about 6.6. Oh God, I forgot. Uh, 6.023, right? One more, right? Okay, times 10 to 10 to 23rd numbers of the molecules, right? So you put one more, we call Avogadro number. Avogadro number, you put the number here, and then you put a one pair of energy together. So this is the total energy for these entities, for this. Uh, sta uh, for this status, right? So this is total energy for the randomly dispersed sodium chloride for one more. It, it makes sense, right? It makes sense. Okay, so you, you, and you put this here and you got something like this. Right, okay, this is case one. How about case two? energy of the one dimensional older crystal it looks like this <coughs> so it's one line for one more okay let's divide into two parts the first part is attraction attraction energy attraction energy, we start from the one one pair energy first so one pair energy is like this one to this one right so r zero so you can get a number like this Right? How about sodium to sodium? 2R, 0. Right? So when you put 2R, 0, when you, this is past negative, you got negative. And you have positive, positive, you got po positive. So you have 2R here. So you put an energy like this, and you add this up. And 3, right? And 4, right? Uh, four, five, six, seven. This is the energy you sum from this one to this one, from this one to this one, from this one to this one. Okay, but of course you have another way. So you need to times two. You need to times two. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a just simple calculation. Just let you know that energy of this for the attraction energy is for one line is like this. And then, 
of course, you rearrange this equation, you will get something like this. You put this constant out and then R out, and you have a parenthesis for this two put it in and then one here. And you put minus sign outside and you got this equation. Okay, so this is called attraction energy. And this is this number is is called Madeleine constant. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to remember the meaning of Madeleine constant. It's kind of geometry. You know, this is one line is kind of geometry. You can have two lines or or like two together here, right? We only think of one line, but you can you might have two. So you have a you will have a different calculation. And then this is called Madeleine constant. It's a kind of geometry effect. You have, if you have different geometry, you have different Madeleine constant. And for the one line, the Madeleine constant represents like this. Okay? So this is attraction energy. However, again, <coughs> this is attraction energy, you put one more, right? And then for adding Avogadro number and the ball repulsion, you can, you can get the one-dimensional um, case two, one-dimensional uh, sodium chloride, the energy will be represented like this. And here, M is, is this one, Madden constant. And N is Avogadro number, right? And the same, this rest of the uh, symbols represent the same as one, as, a, as in a case one, a pair. Okay, so this is the energy. This is the energy of the one-dimensional older crystal. Right. So now the question is, which one is more stable? This the case uh, case one or case two? Which one is more stable? If it's if it's if it's the 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 energy is lower, it represent more stable, right? More stable means it's easier to to uh to see it's easy to be seen in this uh in our life yeah, in the um in the real life right okay so the question is that if you have energy of dispersion looks like this and then one dimensional energy the equation looks like this the only difference is what the only difference is m Madden constant that's for sure because this is M is represent the geometry constant. Okay. So geometric geometry geometrical um, factor is that uh, important. If this M is large, if this M can determine which one, case one or case two, is stable. So let's divide these two energy together. So uh, energy of one dimensional divided by energy of dispersion. And we we got the, and we got the equation looks like this because we remove the rest of the parameters and rest of the uh, symbols. It become like this. So it's m. If this equation larger than one, that means what? That means m is larger than one, right? That means this one will be stable, more stable than this one. If m is less than one, that means is this equation becomes zero point something. That means dispersion energy of dispersion is larger than the distance of one dimensional material. Okay. So, so now the question is: Is this larger than one or smaller than one? Okay. I hope uh, your mess your mess is is okay. So I don't want to waste your time. When you see this, it looks familiar with you, right? When you are in high school, is that true? Okay, it looks the one minus uh, one out one divided by two plus this minus this. So actually, this is a natural log of one plus x. And if you put x equal to z if you put x 
equal to one, that means what? That means you can get this. Okay, so natural log two is what? If you do single calculation, nature, natural log two is larger than one, right? So maiden tungsten will become two times natural log two. And natural log two is zero point something, and then the answer is 1.3. So as you know, the maiden constant is larger than one. That means what? That means this this dimension, this the case two, the molecular represent in the case two is more stable than the molecular uh, the the molecules represent in the state in the case one, right? Okay, so the important thing is once you want to compare many many different uh, structures, you the first of Oh, they need to compare the energy, which structure represent the low has the lowest energy. Then in that case, that and that structure will be more stable. Okay, so let's have an energy diagram here. If we have one pair, for example, one pair is uh, this is energy diagram is zero. So we have minus one, that means what? That means it's one pair dispersion for the sodium chloride. And we got what? We got the um, minus 1.386. That will be one dimensional crystal. That's what we just show you in the previous slide, right? So one dimensional crystal is more stable than the one pair dispersion molecules. It's case one and case two. And when we do the calculation, we realize that the maiden constant for the crystal Three-dimensional crystal is about 1.7. So this is more stable than the others. That means what? This structure is more stable than this structure and more stable than this structure. Okay? One more time. I want to let you know the important key points here is that find out the maiden constant. And then it's maiden constant uh, is is high. That means it's more stable. Okay, this maiden constant is one point three, right? This maiden constant is one point seven. You know, it, this involves more complicated calculation. That's why we don't do it here. But I just want to tell you that do calculation, and then you will find out the maiden constant, and then according to the maiden constant, you realize which type of structure is stable that's the key point okay so three-dimensional crystals are more stable for the ionic bonds right so let's let's take a look at the maiden constant m so different sizes of the cation and ion will have different geometry differences for example, you know that um, for the ionic bonds, you have different type of the uh, cation and ion. Their, their size are all different. So that's why you get different maiden constant. So for the ionic bonding energy, it looks like this is the energy, right? So you have an M here, and this is a single uh, pairs of the energy. And when you put the Avogadro number here, and we put the maiden constant here. This represents the, the ionic bonding energy for case one, or case two, or case three. It can be molecules. It can be a uh, one-dimensional structure. It can be three-dimensional structure. So it all depends on maiden constant. So this is a table show you that the uh, different ionic crystals has their own different. Um, Maiden constant. For example, sodium chloride is 1.747, right? And then cesium chloride is 1.7627. Okay. For zinc blends, uh, okay, it's look it's like this. Okay. Right. Again, you don't need to remember this number. I just want you to know all the diff different 
ionic crystal they have their own magnetic constant because of the geometric differences. Right. So the formation of ionic crystal from the element is that uh, how do we find out how to form uh, from the element step by step? We already tell you basically, but according to the energy, we need to think of this one more time. And this is discovered by Hess law and bohn haber cycle. So Hess law tells us that for any chemical reactions, the energy change is a path of independent. So any chemical reaction involves many, many reactions, and you can divide it in from, autumn, uh, from element to element. This is called Hess law. So here I want to give you an example is that, for example, the sodium, sodium chloride, uh, sodium chloride, the case of sodium chloride. Okay, so from sodium is in the form of solid. Of course, we know that at the room temperature, at the uh, ambient atmosphere, we know that sodium is in the form of solid. And then we have chloride, we have chloride, uh, chlorine gas. We have chlorine gas in it. So in the gas phase, right? Okay, and it eventually become like this. This is what we can, what we normally write down the um, chemical chemical um, reaction. Sodium gas, uh, sodium solid plus chlorine gas becomes sodium chloride, solid crystal. Okay, but. According to Hertz law, we can put this, we can make different, uh, we can have many chemical reactions uh, using uh, element. So for example, so we know that according to ionic bonds, uh, the sodium cation plus chlorine <coughs> anion, of course it's also in the gas form, right? And you become what? Become sodium chloride crystal in the solid but at this moment you should think how sodium sodium solid become sodium cation in gas phase okay this is called has law has law is that of course you have to do it step by step for example sodium become Solid becomes sodium what? Gas. Okay? This requires energy, right? If it's in solid and you give energy to this sodium sodium um, cubes or cube or you get give it sodium metals, you get energy to this, you will sodium will vaporize, become gas. So this is what we call is sublimi sublimation. Sublimation. Okay, and then from the sodium atoms in gas phase to become sodium cation in gas phase. Okay, and he has to release one electron. Right, sodium atom has to release one electron to become sodium cation, and <clears throat> this is called ionization. Ionized, right? Sodium is ionized, so this is what we call ionization. Okay, so this path complete from sodium solid to uh, sodium gas and become sodium chloride solid. Now how about how about chlorine gas? Chlorine gas is that you have to become you have molecular, so you have to become autumn first, right? Autumn first. So what is this called? This is called dissociation. You have you this you tear molecule apart to become atoms. So this is called dissociation. Or we call optimization. Optimization. Again, this requires energy. Right? If you, you need to have energy, you need to have a force to tear this to take this apart. Take this molecule apart. Right. So this is a atom and how to make it become an ion. You have to receive one electron, right? You have to receive one electron and then become an ion. How do you recall this? Remember? When you lose one, you call ionization. When you receive one, what do you call that? 
Remember the trace of the periodical table? Electron affinity, right? You receive one electron, you call electron affinity. You lose the one electron, you call ionization. Okay, so this path is complete. So you can clearly make this path and then clearly know that how you can realize this reaction. This is called hetero. Okay, and finally, this is called crystallization, right? This is called crystallization. And this pass one, pass two, pass three, pass four, and pass five. So from this chemical reaction, you divide, you, you are clearly analyzed. There are only, there are, there are five passes to form this, to get this equation. And the important thing is, if this is, if the energy of this is lower than this energy of these two molecules, uh, two uh, species, that means what? This is more stable than this one, right? Okay, and this is called ball Haber cycle. So the important thing is to, uh, to realize the formation enthalpy, delta H. Okay, so delta H is the formation of the sodium chloride, is the summation of each pass from pass one, pass two, pass three, pass four, and pa plus with pass five. Okay, so let's do this one by one. So, for example, as I told you, that sodium, sodium in solid phase becomes solid gas. That means what? You need to heat this up. Right? Think of it is yeah, you have a uh you have a uh ice cube, for example, you have ice cube and you heat the ice you need to if you want to make ice cube to, be, to become water or to make it become water vapor, you need to give energy to this ice cube, right? So you give energy, so this system receives energy, right? So it's the energy that is a kilojoule per mole, the unit of a ki energy is kilojoule per mole is about 100. So this is pass one. And how about pass two? Pass two is that you have to dissociate the chlorine to become chlorine atoms. Again, you need to give energy to this system. So that, that's why chlorine can be disappeared from become chlorine atom. Okay, and then pass three is that you had to, you need to take out one electron from an atom. That's what we are talk we talk in the in the chapter uh in the section two point four uh two point three two point two right. Okay, ionization energy. Okay, and then you always want to take one electron away from the atom. Then this require ionization energy, which is huge. It's about almost five hundred kilojoule per mole. Okay. And how about pass four? Pass four. Is it release energy or is this process release energy or gain energy? You have to you have to give this system energy or this system will release energy. Which one? Which one? You know, this is you know when you get when you chlorine receive one electron, this become S2P6, right? So it's stable. So that means what? This is more stable than this, this one. So as a result, this will gain, this, this system will release energy, right? Okay, and then according, to Madden, according to the Madden constant, to form a crystal is more, it's very stable. So, this also release the energy. And when you, when you count the energy required for the system and you count the energy released from this system, and this is the net energy, or net reaction is this, and release energy, that means what? That means this system, this, this one is more stable than these two. Right, this is called Bohr-Haber cycle. 
for the standard entropy change from formation of the sodium chloride. Right? Do you learn do you learn this when you are in high school? No? Okay, this is not difficult. Okay. <clears throat> So let's have a brief description of bohr haber cycle. It's an approach to analyzing chemical re chem uh, reaction energies and involve the formation of uh, ionic compounds from reactions of a metal with a non-metal. And allow you to see what rea relative values of the different energy cons uh, components are Okay, and utility of the bohr haber cycle is that uh, important is that you make it elementary steps so you can easier or clearly to understand what's going on with this process. Okay, okay, these two they got Nobel Prize. Okay, and I want to address Haber. Haber is a He's a great man. He do two things which change human uh, human beings. The first one is very good. He he uh, invent um a Hubble, he invent um ammonium, right? From hydrogen and he hydrogen and the nitrogen plus become ammonia. It's a kind of um very good invention using the high temperature and high pressure. So ammonia is what? Ammonia is one uh versatile. So all the foods need this. So according to what people say, he saved about one third of the people in, the, in this planet. So everybody, because of this invention, everybody can have food to eat. Okay, they don't, they don't, um, they don't worry about foods after this invention. Of course, some of them still worry about the food anyway. Okay, this is the first one, it's, it's great. That's why you got Nobel Prize. The second thing he invented is the toxic gas. You know, chloride, chloride um, chlorine gas is toxic. So in the second, uh, first world war, he, he, he invented this and then Germany used a lot of this um, toxic gas to kill a lot of people. His wife died because of this. His wife suicide because of this. His, his wife doesn't want him to do this. And, Anyway, he invented this and killed a lot of people. So, one hand, he saved a lot of people be out of hunger. Uh, another hand, he killed a lot of people in the First World War. Anyway, he is a very, um, you know, anyway. Okay, next topic will be ionic crystal, lattice energies, and uh, radius. Okay, so. Let's think of the uh, latest energy of the ionic solid. When we, when we talk about energy, uh, in the previous, we think of this. The latest energy is like this, right? So it all related to the Madden constant. Okay, the ge geometric factors, it will affect the energy, total energy. And in this case, we call latest energy, latest energy. Okay, there are two factors. The first factor is the Madden constant. If the Madden constant is high, the latest energy will be high. Okay, and another factor is related to the, the charges. As you can see, for example, for sodium chloride, there's a one, there's a, sodium has a one positive charge. Chlorine has a one negative charge. So in, in the end, they only have two electrons, right? But however, if you think of the, Alumina oxide. Alumina oxide, there are six electrons. They, okay? There are six electrons. That means they, they, you have to count this. You have to take this into account and to realize the, what's the uh, energies. That is energy for, all, uh, for some of the um, ionic solids. So, for example, sodium chloride, uh, this is the... Uh, 
this is the energy. You have two electrons. Uh, uh, so this is this uh, seven a seven is the kilojoule per mole. The unit of uh, seven a seven is kilo, uh, kilojoule per mole. Okay, and the melting point is about eight hundred Celsius. Okay, and then so when you think of the sodium oxide, sodium oxide means you have two sodiums and one oxygen. That means what? You have two, two elect, two two times of this. So as you can see, the latest energy is high. Right? It's much higher than this. That means what? Boiling point is also high. Right? How about barium oxide? Barium oxide, there are two charges and two charges. That means what? Turns out it becomes four electron, uh, four um, charges, power two. So the melting point is much higher than this one and this one because this latest energy. What does that mean? Latest energy. Latest energy means that this, if you want to take electron, take atoms or ions apart, this is the energy required. Right? The, the higher energy required, the higher melting points because it's difficult to take it apart. And as you can see, which one is the highest? Ammonia oxide because AlO2O3, right? So this got six times charge power two. So melting point is the highest. So ladies and gentlemen, it, on Friday, if this is the type, the question of Kahu, I want you to compare according to the charges. Because you need to think of melting constant as well as the charges. For example, if I ask you to rank the melting point of the sodium chloride, okay, or and the melting point of sodium oxide, and the melting point of aluminum oxide, and you have to rank which one is the highest melting point. And if this question show up in your midterm exam, and you need to tell me why, not only rank to tell me the answer, but also you need to tell me why. Okay, the reason why is simple. You have one, one, uh, one and one charge, and one and two charge, two and two charge, and three and two charge. That's it. Okay. Are you with me so far? Yes, right? Good. So the Columbic force, if you have more charges, the energy get higher, right? According to this equation. And if energy get higher, you have to, you will change the prop physical properties. The prop physical properties will be changed, for example, like melting point. Okay. And next topic is also important. It's called ionic ion uh, radii. Radii means that if you lose one electron, if or if you gain one electron, what's going to happen with your uh, dimension? What with your with your size, with atomic size? Okay. And this is also important. This will be in your will be the Kahu next week or in your midterm exam. What I want to show you here is that, for example, you have lithium plus and barium two plus, and then uh, nitrogen three plus, oxygen two plus, and then, uh, two minus, uh, three minus, uh, oxygen two minus, and fluorine uh, one minus. And this, and then sodium one plus, and then magnesium two plus. What does this, what does this tell you? If, if I ask you the sodium, uh, nitrogen three plus, oxygen two plus, two mass, I'm sorry. Hello, anybody home? <laughs> okay, fluorine one minus, okay? They represent the same, elect uh, same electron number. Why? 
this goes to helium and this goes to neon why because this is neon electron configuration right electron configuration is s2 p6 right if you get three electrons get two electrons get one electron lose one electron lose two electrons that means what you have different proton number but the same electron numbers okay and the size will be different why the size will be decreased when once your electron once your proton number increased your proton number is increased right and the size will be decreased why and this is the configuration of argon right and this configuration of the Quiton. So as you can see, this is size decrease, size decrease, proton number increase, size decrease. And reason is if the proton is high, radius is decrease. Why? Columbic attraction, right? Because you have same numbers of electrons, but you have more protons. So more proton means what? You have more positive. So you attract negative closer to the uh, nucleus. Then the size will be small. Okay, so please justify your answer according to uh, the, the, the number, the same electron number, but different proton number. Okay, and this is this is um, this is in your um, textbook. You know, this represents lithium, and if you lose one electrons, of course, for the cation the size decrease. However, <clears throat> for the anion the size increase because you gain the electron. Okay, it's the same thing. Right, seems we run out of our time now. So ionic bonding in general is that you know the compounds are composed of the both metallic and non-metallic elements. So ionic bonds always one like electron, one dislike electron. So the elements are situated in the horizontal extremities of the periodical table. Periodical ta periodic table is this part and this part. They come ionic bonds from one this part and one from this part. So metal is metal plus non-metal, okay? So one like donate electron, one like accept electrons, okay? They have very different electron negativity. Remember electron negativity, one like electron, one like electron very much, one doesn't like electron, one like to lose electron. Okay, this is an example. Okay, ionic bonds, the occur between cation and anion, and we already talked about this, and I want to skip this. Okay, so, so as you know that sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide, these are all belong to the uh, ionic bonding. So one is in the periodical on the right hand side, one is on the left, uh, left hand side, one is on the right hand side. Oh, well, these are the um, uh, explanation, please read this by yourself. Okay, so, and we know that this is attraction, attractive energy is this, repulsive energy is this, so we put these two together. That's the net. And here, this page tells you N is about 8. As we know that, I just told you N is between 6 to 12, but average is 8. It depends on different uh, type of the um, ionic bonding, right? Like sodium chloride or cesium chloride. That's different. Okay, but the latest energy of the an ion, uh, ionic solid is maiden constant and the charge. These are two factors you need to single for the latest energy of the ionic bond or ionic solid. Okay, we just learned this. Talk about this, right? 
Okay, so example, I uh, just show you here. This is very easy. Okay, bonding energy. I want you to remember the bonding energy, the bond and ionic bonding is in terms non-directional. It's non-directional. It's like I, what what does that mean non-directional? If you think of directional, that means that the bond has a direction. That means the bond always go to right or go to left. But if it's anywhere, the bond is anywhere, that means it's non-directional. It's non-direction, right? Okay, so normally we call this, this bonding is from a ceramic, or we call ceramic, ceramic materials. And because the bonding is high, so the melting point is high, okay? The bonding energy is about three to eight electron volt. This number is not easy to remember. I always remember this number, three to eight electron volt. So the high melting temperature. Okay, the property of ionic crystal, important. Okay, it's solid at the room temperature. Why? Oh, most of the ionic crystal are in the solid form at room temperature. Why? Because bonding energy is, is, is high. So the room temperature, you know, the thermal energy is not high enough to vaporize this uh, crystal. So that means there's, they, are, they have high melting point and the boiling point is high. So when we talk about melting point and boiling point, we always talk about thermal energy against, against bonding energy. Bonding energy means that means the energy between atoms. And then if you want to break this bond, you need energy. And this energy is called bonding energy. The thermal energy is the energy surrounding this crystal. So if we increase the energy, if, if we increase the thermal energy, for example, like 1,000 Celsius, this atom might lose from this crystal. And if we lose more, that means become liquid, and high, more and more becomes gas. So we, we, when we talk about melting point and the boiling point, we always think thermal energy against bonding energy. And also, the ionic crystal is transparent. It's very beautiful. It's like very beautiful. And it's related to the band gap. It's related to, get to the band gap. We are going to talk about band gap um, also very soon. Okay, so don't worry about this. So we you need to know is crystal is transparent always. Pretty uh perfect crystal, I should say perfect crystal. It's always transparent. And it's a, is electron isolator. Why? Because there's no free electrons. You know, I lose one electron to, I give one electron to this one. So this one becomes S2P6, this one becomes S2P6. So they are very, very stable. So there's no free electron, that's why it's not conductive. I mean, electrical conductive. Okay? So no free electrons. And also it's thermally Insulative, you know, when you when you go to eat um, uh, hot pot, hot pot, you know what hot pot? Huoguo. When you go and eat huoguo, the the high class huoguo is always ceramic container, right? Low class is metal. Right? The high class why why is use ceramic? Because ceramic keep the temperature well, not metal. And why ceramic keep the temperature well? Because it's thermally insulative. The heat cannot deliver from inside to the outside easily. Why? Because this is a property of the ionic crystal. And we talk about, when we talk about temperature, we call atomic vibration. Uh, we, we are going to talk about this um, also in this, in this chapter, okay? But here at this moment, just remember, it's called thermally insulative. Okay, also the property of the ionic crystal is hot and brittle. Hot and brittle. When, you have a, when you have a ceramic, it's, it's very hot, right? Okay, you can, it's very hot, but, it's, but when you drop it, it's easy to break. It's not like metal. Metal is hot, 
But when you drop it, it just changes the shape. It, it doesn't break. Why? When you think of this cartoon, you will realize all the ceramics are negative and partial get together. So it's difficult to take it apart. But once you take it apart, it's easy to become a break. Why? Because when you think of, when you lose one location, when you move this crystal to one position only, one less position, then what happened? The negative, ne positive and positive will repel. So this is strong, and when you break through the energy and become, you move uh, one small distance, you will become, you will break. So that's why we, we call hard and brittle. Brittle is easy to become pieces. So strong bonds means the metal will resist and uh, apply force. Okay, and like sodium chloride, it's it's very strong, but it's easy to 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 solve in the water. Why? Because of the polar. Okay, we'll we'll talk about this. And once it melts, it becomes ionic liquid. Okay, this is a new study very uh, a lot of applications for ionic liquid okay this is one example to tell you that aluminum oxide is a kind of ionic bonds if it's perfect ionic crystal ionic crystal is transparent very beautiful however if it is not perfectly crystal perfectly crystal is not transparent Right. So in the end, it's called electro electrolysis. You know, um, just now everything we talk is neutral plus neutral become cation and ion. So sodium atom chloride, a uh, chlorine atom becomes sodium chloride. And how about vice versa? Vice versa is called electrolysis. We have cation and ion. We want to make it become metal. That's why hot metal is made how alumina is made. Okay, for example, magnesium chloride. If you have magnesium chloride, magnesium cation and chloride and ion, you can, you can make magnesium metal. That's how metal made. Okay, and chlorine gas, which you don't want, right? Toxic gas. Right, this is one of example how you make aluminum. You know, these days you do you use aluminum film a lot and it's very cheap, right? Now how you make aluminum? This is called whole Harrod process. So it's a major industry process for the production of aluminum. So it's from this aluminum oxide. You use aluminum, you put the aluminum oxide into this. Uh, this, pre, this this material and you melt it at a very high temperature which is about 900 960 celsius and you use current to to become electrolysis so the melting uh aluminum will be because it's heavy so you will you will be you will lose your condense in the in the button and another product is carbon dioxide so if you put this and this into this container you apply high temperature and high electrical current and you produce alumina liquid and also carbon dioxide and if you just release here and you will get alumina metal okay this is this is very important why because in the old time alumina is very very expensive the one of example is Washington Monument, you, you know the Washington Monument, right? You know that, right? In the in United States, Washington D.C., in the on the top of this Washington Monument, there's a cube, there's a, a metal here. Do you know why is this metal? It's aluminum, because at the 1876, it's a very very expensive aluminum metal. is very very expensive. How expensive? In two centuries ago, 
aluminum is very expensive. And then because of this invention, um, Hall and the uh, Herat process, the aluminum dropped to 0 0.776 US dollars per pound. Very, very expensive. That's why you can use aluminum, clean, uh, aluminum film at this moment. Very, very cheap. Okay, so thanks for this uh, process. So this process is important and we just use the, the cation and anion to become neutral and neutral, right? Right, okay. So I think I will finish here today and Friday we will start to introduce covalent bonds.